Joining me now on this week's episode of Draft Class is the master of the Joining Me Nows, the dean of Nick's Film School, my boss, uh, Jonathan Macri. John, how we doing? Uh, I'm good, Chris. I'm good. I had... So we're recording this at Friday, uh, Friday at, at a little after eight o'clock. Got my four hours of sleep last night. Um, then uh, went and uh, did, wrote about that draft more, which was fun. Watch my uh, my group of kids. Shout out to uh, Borum Hill School for International Studies class of 2022. Kids that I've taught for the last seven years. Watch them graduate. Shed a few tears. Different kind of tears probably than than last night and uh and then i just took a nap at some point i don't remember when i fell asleep <laughs> i think i woke up like 20 minutes ago <laughs> and now here we are and we're going to talk about <laughs> the draft and uh, i'm honored to be on the show thank you oh well thank you i think it was like 25 but yeah whatever <laughs> so time is a flat circle so for today we have a plan And I had teased last week that the plan involved you guys being the listeners uh, and that you guys would be integral to this final episode of draft class. Well, the day is here. The time has come for the turns to table and they've done so because Jonathan Macri is here to ask me questions. It's a mailbag. Yay. KFS mailbag, the classic. As you guys love it, as John loves it, except this time he doesn't have to answer any of the questions. He can and will and should chime in when he feels strongly or maybe just moderately about a certain opinion. But I'm here to field the questions today. John will be our starting pitcher, and uh, I think he'll pitch the whole game. So we'll see how it goes. We'll see what he's got ready for me. I unlike John can't just not be on Twitter all day, the day after the draft. So I had to mute the conversation (laughs) in which I was uh, tagged for questions. I muted it and I have not seen any of them. I'm ready to go. I'm warming up. I'm warmed up in the cages and uh, let's ride. Uh, Let's start it off. Our first question comes from, Oh wait, hold on. Yeah, you're leaving this in, Andrew. Do I read the bold Twitter thing or the thing that comes after the at sign? The bold Twitter thing. There you um, go. But if it's a hyphen or nothing, then you just do the at because the at has to be something. That's great. Okay. Uh, this one comes from Betts, Mets, Jets with commas in between. That's important for. Hold on. Matter. That's the read now. Now I realize what now, you're now you're asking. Now realize what Twitter account that is. Read the Twitter what? account name. Re- oh, read. okay. This one comes from at more like Mensa. This is Mensa, our boy from. This is Mensa. oh, hey Mensa. Mensa. Yeah, Mensa. There you go. Shout out Mensa, married man. Got to continue. What's, what's going on, Mensa? <laughs> Memory of an elephant, John. I know. <laughs> Finally, yeah, the the question. Knowing how the board fell with Duran and AJ Griffin still available, what would you have done at pick eleven? Okay, so I'll start off by saying the following, which is as an evaluator of these talents from my basement, I do not, did not, will not have access to the kind of medical information that these teams did. And given that AJ Griffin fell to 16, um, I saw him as a top five talent in this year's draft, you know, barring any further complications with the knees. And I was really consistent on draft class and saying that he would have been my number one choice at 11 if he was on the clock. However, he fell to 16. And that tells me that I shouldn't be crying in the corner, sucking my thumb in my room because for a talent to fall that far for Jonathan Wasserman to have been saying the week before the draft that New York would go Branham over Griffin because of Griffin's medicals, something was off. And I don't know if it was the knees, maybe something else was discovered. My guess would be the knees, but I'm not here to speculate on that. I just, that's the first thing to get out of the way. Um, Secondly, it seems like they're going to be able to retain Mitch at conveniently for them. The exact number I said would be the most I would pay him per year. So technically um, I'm not upset about them not looking for a center. If they didn't believe that Durin was someone to chase after, I just, 
I had him eight on my board. I didn't think he was top five, but a lot of people that are smarter than me did. And he's really going to be good in my opinion. So I think it would have been nice for the team to take that step back in timeline and say, all right, we want to do youth. Watch this and pick up a raw center, some Rob Williams at Texas vibes from Durin. Uh, Williams, someone who got underrated for, I think, a lot of the same reasons as a prospect that Duran did. And I know he had some off-the-court concerns. Even once he got drafted, he was late to his first couple of team meetings, whatever. And they were like, the Boston fans were questioning his professionalism. And now they were thanking him for playing in the finals. Anyway, uh, I, I think that Duran on the court is getting underrated as a prospect in the ways that Williams was. It's just less the the market's corrected on this and Duran has been getting mocked top 10 top 15 as opposed to Williams who went in the late 20s i have to say that with johnny davis gone i probably would have gone aj griffin however if i knew what the knicks seem to have known about his medicals that while 29 teams knew as well that led to atlanta who kind of needs wing talent you can't really have enough but if they're trying to win right now that would be nice um he fell to 16 so i would have gone jalen williams uh out of santa clara at 11 and i and not well not at 11 but with that pick and i would have gotten someone to overpay me for duren the way we got okc to overpay for jank that's just what i would have done i would have tried to get back with charlotte to 13 and then he would have been gone, you know, so I can, I can get why they didn't do that. Right. But that's just, that would have been my game plan I was like, all right, I'm going to go target Jalen Williams, call OKC about getting a pick back one pick back and see if they would give up that pick. Maybe they would have taken Jiang. Right. But that's probably who I would have targeted if they didn't want to go with the center. They didn't want to set the timeline back. Me personally, I would have just gone Durant, best talent on the board. But if I were thinking as the Knicks, I would have tried to wind up with Jalen Williams. Um, I think you nailed it with Griffin. Uh, you draft the center like Duran, so that you in four years could be in a position like you are literally right now with Mitch Robinson. So to start, mm, I don't see those guys as being in the same world. Though. Uh, well, well, we'll find out in, four, in probably whatever, one, <laughs> yep. two, three years. Um, yeah. But one thing that is usually pretty clear, it, it takes a while for centers to actually contribute to to helping you win. The point is you go through those early years and then you get the benefit, you know, on the next contract usually. So um, to restart the clock when you got a guy who, you know, does some, does some nice things. We, we don't have to talk about Mitch right now. Um, I'm with you, man. Uh, I think, you know, it's unfair to ask the Knicks to operate different organizationally as they do. Williams is a guy that would have helped them now. I don't know where he's playing in the rotation, the whole thing that again, different conversation, but I love that answer. I, that's that, that would, if, they, if I have to give a player, that would be my player too. Um, talking Knicks asks, tell me everything I need to know about all caps heels. Oh, Hey, this is fun. Um, I'm going to start off with a quote, not verbatim, but just paraphrased from the awesome Twitter account Mavs draft. Uh, he said about Keels in March that he sees like a light, you know, L I T E diet soda version of Kyle Lowry from early in his career wow. in Trevor Keels. Lowry famously shot like 25% from three up until his like fourth or fifth year in the NBA. Um, and Keels is large, Broad shoulders, uh, <laughs> muscular, pretty brolic, if you ask me. Baby uh, fat was a term thrown into uh, one of the athletic terms that with the, or with articles with those uh, anonymous coaches and whatnot. I just want to throw, throw yeah, that he, he could slim down a little. He's also one of the prospects in this draft that's younger than me. Um, he's, he's not 19 right now. He's not 19 yet. And I just turned 20. That's... Wow. Right. So Keels to me, I, I was just telling Schwinn earlier today, he reminds me of a prospect that's like 23 as a senior and like kind of can do a little bit of everything, but nothing is really super well-rounded. So he's a good college player, but goes to the league and like nothing really comes of him except he's five years younger than those guys usually are. Like he's actually got the potential to 
grow in a lot of different regards. Victor Oladipo is another name that I want to throw out there as someone who, yes, was the number two overall pick, but took a couple years. John maybe can attest to uh, back in his Indiana days to really turn into someone, into a guy, right? Maybe Keels never becomes the guy that Depot was in the playoffs against LeBron James, but that's okay because he was the 42nd pick. So yeah, playmaking, secondary playmaker is probably your hope. That's the upside is he's a secondary playmaker. I will say and start off by saying that four and I'll I'll just keep calling him 19 because that's how old he'll be when the season starts Four and 19 year old. He actually has some uh, pretty nice feel in the in the pick and roll. And if you look at his per 40 minute stats in a super, super small role at Duke, he was averaging three and a half assists. So this guy is playing with AJ Griffin and Paolo Boncaro. Yes, he's got good teammates to pass to, but 3.6 3.6 assists per 40 minutes. Okay. He's not just like shucking up shots. You know, he's not just a catch and shoot guy, right? He's doing some stuff. Um, he's conservative though. So the turnovers are low with him. He's not really a gambler. Obviously you need some gamblers to take your team to the next level, but from a guy who might be a secondary playmaker, I don't think you're looking for him to be, you know, throw in those plus 7,500 odds passes to try to get a cool highlight lob. Um, And yeah, I think what I really like about him and what what makes me a sucker for him and why I have tweets too going back for months saying like, hey, this kid's legit is because with that frame, he really likes trying to get to the rim. Maybe it doesn't always work. Maybe he's really young and he has the right ideas for how he can impact a game in in a positive way. Um, the glaring thing with him that people are going to talk about is going to be the shooting, the percentages at Duke, right? The same percentages in college that made people want to take Neesmith with the eighth overall pick that year, uh, you know, are going to be the percentages that make people think this guy stinks. He was 30% catch and shoot in half court offense. Yuck, right? But I think he'll be better. And he was a good shooter in high school, like knockdown shooter in high school. So this isn't blind faith. This isn't like, oh, well, the shot looks pretty. Like, No, he was knocked down the last four years. He came to Duke, didn't necessarily have the most rhythmic offensive role. It was very much playing off of these two other guys who have kind of different play styles and AJ and Paolo. Maybe there's a shot that he'll have a shot in the league to make a shot, which would be nice. Um, I also think off the ball, I was just, you know, I've been teaching camp recently and I actually just took the other day, like 10 minutes to give the kids a speech about Quentin Grimes and how he went to Kansas, went to a big name school to be their like primary ball handler and ended up not being too good at getting separation, went back home to Houston, took on a different role, a little bit more three and D and found how to contribute still got drafted first round of the NBA. I kind of like used his college career as a teaching moment for them. What I really like that reminds me of Grimes and even, you know, throw out a name to excite people would be like the clays of the league. Like the relocation off the ball for him is just really smart. And I'll say it again. This is why I think he plays like a 23 year old. Like he plays like he's played college all four seasons, but he's not even 19. I had him 36 on my board. Uh, I really liked him as an early second round grab, a late first round reach. I would have called it a reach, but it wouldn't have been offensive to me if someone took him 28, right? We got him at 42. So just like with Deuce McBride, I like Deuce more. I think, you know, if you gun to my head, Deuce will be the better player, right? But I had Deuce 21 that year and we got him at 36. That's already something positive to me. And Keels to a lesser degree, lesser prospect, lower on my board. But yeah, it, it's cool. And I, and I like the pick. Um. I, w- I certainly won't add anything to Keels as a prospect because God knows you've done a lot more homework on him than me. I'll, I'll just throw out. I saw a comment to Benji's uh, great film thread earlier today on Keels. 25 parts. Mad great. Man. Just awesome stuff. He's Psycho. shout out to Benji. That dude's Love amazing. Um, you know, someone was like, was like, why do we even care about this guy? Um, he's not going to play. And, and somebody else I saw saying something like, uh, you know, what, what did we waste to pick on McBride for? And then we just, then now we have this guy and like Jacobitis. My view on this stuff is like, it's second round picks. If one out of every three hits and becomes a contributing NBA rotation player to your decent team, you're probably doing pretty good. So I like, whether it's him or Deuce or honestly, Jacobitis at some point in the next like couple of years, if one of them hits, I would, I, I personally would be pretty happy with that. Um, that ratio. Can I get 
Can I get a one sentence takeoff? Please. I promise I'll keep it to one sentence about Rokas. Yeah. All right. Let me pull out my big board real quick to get the exact. I got it right here. Don't worry. It's my pin. Uh, yeah. Okay. Rokas, top 25 prospect in this year's draft. It's not bad. But um, number 25, exactly. So not. That's okay. <laughs> but yeah, that's where I would have put him given this season of tape in Europe. Um, so maybe well i don't know about transition uh just a question from jack robbins 71 who is your winner of the draft oh man this is going to make people cry isn't it obvious it's the detroit pistons yeah i mean what what's just is there any i'm trying to think of what what would be the other answer a lot of people have the physically big big three as in some order, the top three on their big board, I bucked that trend to put Jabari Smith fourth in favor, not as an insult to him. I spent a lot of time explaining that this was not supposed to be an insult to have someone as a top four prospect in an NBA draft, but I had Jaden Ivy third, right? So they get him and at five, not only did they get a top three player in the draft, but they got him two picks after the third pick happened. And then Duran is eighth on my board. They got him for taking on Kemba Walker's $8 million expiring real albatross. And then they got, they got Proceda, right? They got Gabrielle Proceda. Sure. You're going you're gonna to make me look, <laughs> this look up, on edge of the mind's face. You're going to make, make me look this up. I'm pretty sure they got Proceda. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They got Proceda at 36 overall. Proceda, he probably doesn't even know if they got him. So the fact that you okay, know. let's let's respect Gabrielle. He was 34 on my board ahead oh, okay. of Trevor Keels. I would love to look silly, but man, you talk about I hate that I'm about to utter these words because they are the ultimate stereotype oh he is a fantastic shooter who is sneakily athletic and i wish i was lying that's his exact description and i i i know it's the classic ron baker white lunch pail guy description but he's actually a really like he was taking step back threes and looking like he does those for breakfast. Like, I don't know. It was really natural. And it, he was playing in a league where you're taught to play like a team player. And he was playing like a team player and then banging step backs in guys' faces when he felt like it. Knockdown shooter, great athlete, a 36 pick. If he doesn't hit, you've got the other two, right? Like, who cares? If he does hit, that's a really interesting bench wing for them uh, that can space the floor for Kate or, or whoever off the bench. Um, I'll just shout out, uh, and I, I think San Antonio kept all of its picks that it had going in nine, twenty, and twenty-five. Um, I like them getting Sohan, um, Branham, and a guy that obviously we both I know like in Blake Wesley. Um, great job by them. And then uh, yeah. I was waiting, waiting, waiting for New York after trading eleven to get in the back of the first for Wesley just waiting. Yeah. I was, I was, I was hoping I was hoping I was watching him fall and I'm like, man, that's, that would be nice. And then just two other teams I would shout out really quickly. Like the Rockets I, again, I, I didn't do any homework on Jabari. Like I know what Jabari Smith is as a general outline. I didn't do deep dives on him because I knew he, he wasn't going to the Knicks, but I did do enough on Ter- uh, Tari Eason to know that like, I didn't, I don't know if I wanted him at 11 for the Knicks, but like, there's some real there. And I know you like Eason as well. Yeah. So for yeah. them to get Smith and Eason, I like that. And then just, you know, okay. See, I mean, they got three guys who are, you know, different types of players, but you could argue reasons for, for all three of them. So I like that too. The different kinds of prospects too. Really. Yeah, exactly. That's what I, I should have phrased it better. Uh, that is exactly what I meant to say. Okay. Um, so this is, we'll take it in a slightly different direction here. This one comes from at, PJ Akabus 56 goes by two Jakes. They said, I'm getting the hang of it. Uh, what did Sacramento and or Detroit want for Ivy? And what did we offer? So Andrews gave me a little producer's note here that we could either. Cause like, I don't know about you. I didn't. Well, I'll, I will. I'll start this by say, saying the, the thing I heard is Detroit wanted another 
Knicks first. So I, I don't know what the Knicks offered. I don't know what player they offered. I don't know what in terms of any of that stuff. But whatever it was, I th- I've heard. I heard they wanted an additional Knicks first round pick. No idea of the protections, any of that stuff. Um, but we could talk about what we would have given up to go to four or five. And, and it doesn't sound like Sacramento was really entertaining trading down because they wanted Murray. Mur- Murray, um, yeah, Murray. I can say that Detroit likes Cam very much fits Weaver's bill. Um, And that I think they were negotiating so heavily with Detroit as counter leverage to Sacramento saying that they were fine, just drafting at four and not trading down. Um, That pick would have probably been, I believe 11 and the Mavs pick were what they put on the table. Remember the SNY report, veteran young player. Yep picks so 11 and the Mavs pick were on the table with Sacramento and I know that and what else was on the table with Sacramento was Burks and Grimes Um, and Sacramento rebuffed their first trade offer which was lesser and they upped it to that and Sacramento was holding out I was told trying to get Toppin and it would make sense considering the rumors that they were after Collins so I buy it at least like half so. Um and, I can see and it. yeah, and I think that was the holdout. I know the Knicks were really high on Obi the year of his draft, and he's someone who they love having in the building, yada yada. So not someone they were wanting to part with along with several first rounders for an unknown of a prospect, right? Like technically any draft pick, you know, yeah. And then Detroit same thing as you. I heard it was a Knicks owned pick that that they wanted and and not heavily protected, like not a Brock Aller special. No, no mornings like yeah, no, no morning smoothie prepared by Brock <laughs> with the freshest of fruits. Just just a pick. Oh, fruits. Uh, I, I also someone in Sacramento said they like Cam. But I I don't know. I feel like Grimes makes more sense for them. You could start him next to Fox and he could guard the point of attack. So yeah, um, pick player. No, sorry. A vet, young player, 11, other pick. And I think they had somewhat filled out who vet and who young player would be with Detroit, but they wanted that whole extra first and not in a way that was advantageous to New York like at all. I'll just say what I wouldn't have given up. I would not. I think the most I would have gone in terms of future picks, like I think it, you nailed it. It comes down to protections and it comes down and that, then to how many picks and I'm not giving up a pick in next year's draft unless it is top four protected. And I say top four specifically because I think, yeah, sure. There's a world where the Knicks finish with like the worst record in the league next year or something or second worst and like fifth pick, sixth pick is on the table. I think more likely you're looking at a Knicks team that you know, God knows, maybe they blow away our expectations and win, I don't know, 50 games. Um, but maybe they're around 500 either way or, or maybe it's a season like this year, a little worse, something like that. Either way, you have to, you just have to guard against the possibility that you get lucky on draft night and, and, and jump into the top four. Cause like if, if that happened and then they sent the pick away, um, I'm not going to say it wouldn't matter how good um, Ivy is. Cause that's not true. If Ivy's as good as, you know, ceiling projections are, then you, you do what you, you know, you, it's like you get them and you're just happy you have them. You don't, you know, you don't ask questions later, but I think I would have kept the four top four protections on. And then it, like, if I got top four protections there, and like, if it lands in the top four, then maybe if I could get it converted to two seconds, then maybe I would have been okay giving another first at some point. But like, that inhibits your ability to make a trade. Eh, maybe swap rights in twenty twenty four, something like that. I I, I would have gone there. I think with some protections again on the swap. Yeah, didn't happen. Live and live and live. Let's see another day, right? Um. Maybe maybe a little live and learn too. Well, maybe well, I I should hope this is we're past the living and learning stage for Brock Aller. This is this is, he is supposed to be the master class at this, right? It's a matter of what they want to do, you know. And then they what they, they they wanted to do what they wanted to do and didn't want to do what they didn't want to do. Um, okay, this next one, 
Fantastic. <laughs> From Triple M, uh, what's up? Oh, Mario. I love what's how up, you know man? who this person is. Um, Nick Snag, Gene Montero, a projected first round pick earlier in this year. Did not know that. Uh, will he surprise people this year? Don't be biased, Chris. And then three Dominican flags with a crying emoji. Crying, uh, laughing emoji? Yeah, it's got to be. Crying, yeah. laughing emoji. Andrew um, has to tell me what the emoji is. Good. So God. sad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what up, Mario? Bello mio. Uh, Jean Montero, man, he is fun. Um, I, the ultimate, you know, like Prez bait. Prez is always talking about like what aspects of prospects are Prez bait. Like he just falls in love with prospects if they do a certain kind of crossover that's from the 80s because he's a sucker for that. For me, and this really shows that I don't have anything against Jalen Brunson. I just like philo- philosophically disagree with clearing the books to go get him or just getting him for that price, whatever my like ultimate Chris bait thing for point guards is controlling the pace of a game. Um, the ultimate thing for me that like, if you can't shoot, if you, if you can't do anything, but you can pass and you can control the pace of a basketball game where there are good players on the court and maybe you're not the best, but you're dictating the, the tempo of the game. I'm going to be a sucker for you. I'm going to love you as a prospect. And when you combine that attribute of Jean Montero's with the fact that he sees that as his favorite aspect of his own game, the thing that he thinks is the most special about him. That's cool to me. On top of that, attacking in transition, he is one shifty little guy. I mean, he's not too tall, right? But he's smart and he's, he's good out there. I think in the pick and roll, um, that's where he really shows his like control of pace stuff. And while he's at it, he, uh, he's a good passer. He, he's, he's good at what he's doing in the pick and roll. I do think though, and I, I know you'll probably agree, John, that like the highest archetype of point guard is always going to involve someone who can hit the above the break threes coming off the screen. If they get left, if the team goes under and they have the spot that you just got to pull it right. That's, you know, the, the shot that's gotten Dame Lillard, so many highlights just, just pulling from 40. Jean can't even pull from like 26. You know what I mean? Like he is not a fantastic above the break three point shooter coming off of those screens. And so that whole aspect, that whole dimension of his offense isn't opened up because of that. I think due to his smaller stature, he's going to struggle to make an instant impact in the NBA, which is why at least part of why I I feel that he fell literally out of the entire draft. Um, However, you know, besides whatever concerns led to that, maybe some interview stuff or off. I don't want to speculate, but off court stuff, right? Like, yeah, he got picked up by a team who needs a point guard and (laughs) they're taking a shot at one with him. Maybe even if it's just for Westchester, right. You know, get, the fans all from my just my cousins in the seats yeah. in Westchester. Get, get it's a marketing get, ploy. Get us driving up. Hey, man, you know how big the wave for Duarte was in I, especially, especially in Washington Heights, but in New York City sure. from Dominicans. Yeah. Like it was real, man. And I think that's that might be a thing. But I also think Jean Montero is actually just good at basketball. Like he has a really nice and and just like he's not. He's very aware that he has a good handle and he uses it to his advantage, especially when people try to crowd him because of his small size. So like he'll get trapped on the side. I I see him figuring out exactly how to squeeze out of there and pop up to Obi or whatever. I'm imagining him playing at NBA minutes because I would like for that to happen at some point as a fan of him. But yeah, no, it's going to be Westchester. Regardless, I, I don't think we see him play in the NBA this year for the Knicks, just because they um, probably will not be as injury prone at that position as they were last season. Hopefully we don't see him play, but I I also think that he's the kind of player that Tom Thibodeau would not hate getting to try out for a night and getting to see what he could do in the pick and roll (laughs) running the offense. And no, don't no jokes about what I just said. I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't going to say that. I was going to say, look, uh, now with Fred, Fred Van Vliet, we have a track, we have a, a precedent of an undrafted uh, player, undrafted point guard, especially making the all-star team. So, you know, you never, you never know. 
Uh, next question. I'll do that. Uh, this one's from Khan uh, at John Rivers Pupil. I think I got that right. Is there a blue chip prospect next season like an Amen Thomas? I hope I wrote, wrote, read that correctly. Or a Scoot- what? Amen Thompson. Ahmed Thompson. What did I say? Thomas. Jesus Christ. Oops, I, I need sleep. Um, <laughs> or a Scoot Henderson uh, who may have connections to some in our front office. And we may cash in chips, cash in chips for a trade up next year. Okay, so duh, that's that's tough. Um, to who? DJ I'll just say, Wagner. I have no idea what what for. I mean, are are these people D- already associated DJ, with CIA or something? DJ Wagner. DJ Wagner. He yeah, is. Well, we, he's a top. Not want to say one. And just get a takeoff. Um, he's a top three guard in the class, maybe. He's in next year's class. Oh, I didn't in, even realize twenty twenty three. Um, and uh, Kentucky and Louisville are literally having like a college basketball civil war trying to recruit this kid. Uh, Is he very, playing college ball next year? I'm sorry, next year. Yeah. Okay, I, so that's I, what I, I was think. Sure. And he's okay. He's seventeen now. Um, he's Dewan Wagner's son, <sighs> and more importantly, Wilt Milt Wagner's grandson. Milt Wagner's grandson, who Louisville just hired conveniently before trying to recruit him. Um, you know what Kentucky did in response to them getting Kenny Payne and and Milt Wagner? What Sham Sham God is a reported hire for Kentucky as a development coach. Cal said. You want to go for family? I'll do what you can't, and I'll bring the Brinks trucks out. I'm getting elite, elite training, and this kid won't be able to pass it up. And so this this kid's gonna have to choose. And and I gotta say, man, the Wagner family, they might owe Coach Cal a favor. So I could see that going either way. Uh, legitimately, I could see him going to play with Grandpa. I could see him going to Coach Cal. So yeah, I, I long story short, surprise, surprise, whoop de doo, William Wesley is a known associate of everyone I just named, including the Wagners, including DJ, you know, DJ probably of oh God. I mean everything. He's Uncle West to everyone, but like, yeah. I just that kid, class of 2023, point guard, Camden High School. He's actually part of the reason slight part of the reason why Rick Brunson stayed uh, to be their head coach was to, to coach a talent like him. For for anybody who wants to know a little bit more about what Chris is talking about, just Google uh, GQ article, uh, World Wide West, and uh, article from about a decade ago. I, I actually interviewed the author at one point on, on our pod. I forget when. And um, a lot of backstory in there and you could educate yourself. Uh, if you're a Nick fan, if you're listening to this and you haven't read that article, it's it's worth a read. You're gonna you're gonna learn a lot about the guy, the people who are now running the Knicks. Um, okay, next question. This is coming from Bradley Samper. I I hope I pronounced that correctly. Now that we know what the return was on draft night, what are we expecting this surplus of picks to turn into? An all-star caliber player that's under the age of 27. <laughs> and then it's just someone, man, someone. Uh, Mark Berman, who is the guy who I would look to for like a, a draft night reaction from the team that they, you know, want to get out there to soothe tempers. Um, said a Donovan Mitchell like trade is going to be the the long term goal for these draft picks. I just tweeted today that it, we can't evaluate this trade until we see what the Knicks trade these draft picks for. And I was like, I would say who they draft, like I do with any other team, but we know they're not drafting with these picks. This is ammunition in the war chest, and talk about you know this is what I get actually. This is what I get for spending the last several weeks leading the charge to not trade IQ or OB and to instead include draft picks in trades. They said, oh, you want draft picks and not to include prospects? Oh, let's get three. 
and give you no prospects so that we can keep all these guys. And then when that time for that trade comes around, um, you know, maybe there's a young guard who we helped get paid who might want to sign here that we say, Hey, you want to go be a number one option in Utah. Um, and they say, it was nice to have you son, but go enjoy getting your 28 a night and your hundred million dollars. <laughs> and they add to that, you know, maybe Cam Reddish and a bunch of first round picks and right there is your star package. Boom. You know, so it's like, or not Reddish cause he would need to get paid, but someone else, right. Uh, Jeremy's Jeremy's hair on the back of his neck just flared up when I said that somewhere in America. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, I think that this is ammo. I think we can expect it to be used on an all-star, maybe not someone who's made the game yet, but I, I tend to stop using that to the actual game appearances to determine who I call all-stars and just all-stars, all-star caliber players or all-star caliber players, that kind of guy. And someone who the Knicks either will be receiving with multiple years left on his deal or who already has Wes saved in his phone as Unk and who has agreed behind the scenes to sign a five-year extension. So, yeah. Um, I'm actually going to pivot to one a follow-up question that somebody asked. This is from uh, Chris Cortez. One, what is your hot take all-in trade that you see the Knicks doing with all the draft capital they now have? You mentioned Mitchell by name because Berman sent out that tweet and that's, that's the obvious one. Do you have a hot take? guy in mind as someone else who it, it might with the understanding that there is nobody else that's obvious right now. I'm just curious if you have a name in the back of your mind. There's always going to be Shea Gilgis Alexander. I'm always going to be thinking they just added Chet, J-Dub, and Jang. If you add Wemby to Chet, like Chet and when Banyama, bro, <laughs> we'd be so screwed. We'd be so screwed. That would be something. And, uh, I, you know, with all these picks, maybe they tell Oklahoma city, Hey, you know, those three, you just gave us. And that's why it's a hot take is because there's no way they're just going to trade those all right back. But like, yeah, that's the guy that comes to mind and and no one comes to mind as someone they're trading for this summer. Cause I just don't see, and please God, let there be a situation where this gets pulled as a clip and I get laughed at for being stupid, but I don't think that big trade happens this summer, like at all. So yeah. yeah. Um, okay. This one comes from Jules. Uh, I, his, uh, hold on. He has a longer Twitter handle at Haitian love God. Oh, that's very nice. Uh, seeing that we didn't use the 11th pick for this past draft, is Leon Rose really about the youth movement or is he still trying to put pieces around the Randall of two years ago? Okay. I think to answer that, I will say that you should change the second part of that question, not to try to revive Randall and surround him with pieces, but just like win now mentality. And then for the real answer that actually has nuance, you should go to your email and open Jonathan Macri's newsletter from this morning. Yeah, it's very kind of you because I read it at work while the head coach was running a drill that didn't need a ref or anyone to run the other side of the gym. And I sat and read your newsletter and it was um, Cedric from Nick's chatter day after described it as required reading today in a group chat. I'm in with him and you know, whether you agree with John or not, I think that perspective being injected into your fish tank of thoughts uh, would would benefit the other fish. I think it's healthy for them. Um, so, yeah, thank you. I, I will say that I will then add my own note, which is I really would have liked to have seen them obviously just go full youth tank, knowing that they have the support of Dolan and not a full intentional tank, but what Jeremy calls tanking, which is what I call development. So I'll throw, I'll throw him a bone. Uh, just play the kids, right. You know, like don't live in a world where someone says, like, if someone asked me right now, is Deuce McBride playing this season? I'd be like, <laughs> no. Right. And that's like, that sucks. That's sad to me. So I, I don't know, be in a position where the 
if you want to view them as assets, if you want to be heartless and cold and whatever, and be like, all right, well, these are assets that the new regime acquired since getting hired and they're depreciating in value greatly due to another decision they made, which was hiring Tom Thibodeau. It's like buying gorgeous, gorgeous, uh, like beautiful, blooming, budding flowers for your front lawn. <laughs> And then just sitting there with like weed killer and just like nonstop spraying it on them and being like, this is healthy. You know, like I just like this, these guys are human beings. They need development. They need to feel believed in. They need confidence. They need, I, I don't know, man. The, the fact that like the kid who just dropped 50% of his nine threes per game in Westchester in the hoop <laughs> is going to be back there for another season with his brolic buddy, Trevor Keels. Now I just, I, I don't know, man. It doesn't, strike me as particularly inspiring when the reason we're doing this is to outbid a contender for a non-all-star at a position where they just drafted two prospects in the last two years. Well said. Last serious question. Then we got one more to finish up. Um, <laughs> at, at S Norma 11, you guys must have a feeling of futility today after all the, the lists, talk, prognostications, and most of it was wrong. Is guessing what Leon Rose is going to do a worthy pursuit? For all the work Chris did, he could have finished. <laughs> okay. For all the work Chris did, he could have finished medical school and we'd be the same at Knicks. Um, oh man, I think that. I described him as such when Mark Berman was on draft class. And I described him as such when Ian Begley was on draft class. Leon Rose is a media mastermind. He is always weaving things, right? Uh, And it's backfired. I just tweeted about this. It seemingly backfired on him twice, which was when the people knew that they wanted Ivy. People know that they want Brunson. Do we think that Detroit, knowing they really want to clear cap space for Brunson, played a role in what they gave up to them to take on the, again, albatross 8 million expiring deal that Kemba Walker is? You know, like who are the Knicks as a team right now to not just eat that money? Who do we think we are? Who do we think we're going to be as a team to not just sit and eat that money? Unless there's a move that I have no idea what it is because it's futile to try to figure out what Leon Rose is doing. Um, I don't think that happens, right? So it's like, I don't think we're good enough where I'm saying, oh, thank God we cleared off Kemba to get Brunson because otherwise we wouldn't have made the ECF this year and this invaluable experience for... No, it's like Brunson and Randall, if everything goes right, being your duo and then RJ like being there for vibes maybe and to pressure the rim a little bit. Uh, I'm so uninspired. I'm just so uninspired on paper. The trade with Oklahoma city was great. It was actually not just good. It was great on paper as someone who spent too many hours researching this draft class. It was not some home run, every pitch, every other pitch draft class. Once you got out of the top seven, in my opinion, uh, so it was like, I get do it, that trade, the trade with Detroit. I actually like that trade to clear up the cap space. If there's someone in free agency that drastically changes the foundation of this team and what their ambitions are in the near and long term future, uh, but there's not. And if there is, and God knows, Kyrie, KD, please, yuck. But like, man, uh, uh, Brunson is not that to me personally. And that's why with who we are as a team, I don't get like who we are to not just eat Kemba's money. I don't get who we are to not play deuce, to not enable quick more than we did. We, we, we did it in summer league. And then the, you know, February game against the Lakers comes around February game against the Lakers comes around and goes to overtime and he logs nine minutes. It's just like, I'll never get over that. That, that one game, I will never get over. Uh, um, I know. Uh, uninspired is a great word. Uh, I'm I'm a little, a little higher on the idea of signing Brunson than you are, obviously. But uninspired is a good word because you picture him on, uh, on next year's Knicks team. And for the reasons you stated, um, it's not like there is an obvious vision of like, oh, this is going to solve all of these problems because there are problems that have nothing to do with the point guard position and and uh, they have to figure those those issues out. We'll see if they do. Um, last question. This one comes to us from 
none other than the uh, basketball operations uh, at senior basketball operations analyst, excuse me, oh. sport, of Sports Info Solutions, jo- joined us last night, Spencer Perlman at SK Perlman. Um, not an NBA draft question per se, but if there were a Uh-oh. bear draft, what kind of bear is best, assuming you have the first overall pick? Is there at least a picture of Dwight Schrute? Yes, it's a it's a GIF. Ah, so it's Jim as Dwight. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, it's that GIF. It's that GIF. Ah, ah. Okay. Um. Wow. I'm gonna take this opportunity to share the fun fact that polar bears are black and have translucent fur that, because of all the ice reflects white and that is why to the eye they look white polar bears when shaved are they look like black bears and their fur is not white it's clear it's clear fur i will also take this opportunity to share that koala bears after they've been in the rain or or are soaked wet look like a terrifying cat coming to kill you if you look up a, a koala bear like soaked you will have nightmares. It's not, it ruined my perception of what I thought was the cutest animal. For that reason, koala bear, young Chris's pick, old Chris, not in the top three. Polar bear, number one. John, what's your first pick? Um, I'm partial I took that to a, more what? seriously than Spencer was expecting. No, it was, I, I'm, not, I'm taking it seriously as well. I'm partial to a grizzly, you know, um, big. Big fan of uh, Great Outdoors, which is a great '80s movie that uh, never heard of. This is I was about to say <laughs> certainly twenty years of. before Chris was born. Yes, actually, I think it's an '80s movie. It may have been early '90s. I'm pretty sure it's late '80s. So um, you were already 36. That's great. <laughs> I feel I feel that of like what that age would work out to be. Uh, yeah, so Grizzly Bear. Uh, I'll go Walter Andrew? Payton. I'll go Walter Payton. Ah, Walter Payton. That's a good one. That's, that's a good great. one. I like that. or uh, Winnie the Winnie. I was the other answer I had was Winnie. Winnie the Pooh. Yes. Yeah. Or I mean, Yogi is that Paddington's up there for me too. Oh. I have not seen either of the Paddington movies. Mm. Uh, your I know daughter, Your daughter would love both, mm. especially Paddington. Paddington too. I've heard Paddington too is the better film. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Well. It's fun. It's fun though, isn't it? Isn't it fun? Yeah, no, this was fun. It was cool. Um, cool. And I'll just say one last time. I know I, we, did, I did enjoy. We, I know we've said it a lot, but you, I mean, really just killed it this whole time. And uh, you know, it's uh, it does suck a little bit that they didn't actually get a player in the first round after everything you've done. No, but how else was it going to go, dude? Well, I for I will give myself a, a pat on the back because you predicted two and a half months ago in my first new, the, literally the first week after the season ended, I did off season predictions, and my literally my first off season prediction was they're going to trade their draft pick. And well, I laid out all the reasons why, and then yeah. Well, yesterday before the draft, you tweeted out three predictions, and I that was, that was I wasn't that off base, right? And the first one was that. Hold on! Don't 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 say it. The first one was that they wouldn't move up. The second one was that AJ would be there and they'd pass. So someone knew about the medicals named Bonathan Dacry. And then um, you said that they would trade down. I think I said they would trade down or they would draft someone that was a surprise. And I I put like Jalen Duran question mark, which I don't know. Do I deserve partial credit for the fact that they briefly <laughs> acquired Jalen Duran? You know, you know what was interesting, just because you and I spent some time following the odds. Usman Jiang, as of the day of the draft, was plus eight hundred to be the Knicks' first selection in the draft, yeah. and, and that was those were like the fourth best odds tied with Ivy, which to me was fascinating because why wasn't he there earlier? Why would he was plus eleven hundred back when Ivy was plus eight hundred? Why did he come down before the draft? It's who told them that we were going to draft him for another team? Like that's so fast. I mean, I think I that Vegas, I, I think the, I think the Knicks, uh, I don't know. The Knicks fate was sealed, but like once, once Kentucky took sharp there, because that was the, 
that was the Dan- that was talked about as the Daniels team, and then Portland. Once- you mean Port- Portland? When what did Portland, I say? Kentucky. Jesus Christ! Again, I need sleep. Yes. Once once Portland took sharp, and we need a supercut of all the Jesus Christs in this pod. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then uh, and then that, and then Zhang was the rumored. Pels team, but once Daniels was still on the board for the Pels, and I, obviously he went there. I think at that point you could have you saw the dominoes falling, and then it was just a matter of like, oh, right, do the Knicks trade down or do they trade the highest pedigree prospect and then trade it to somebody else? I have to shout out Chip Murphy right now because he is with me in having David Griffin as a terrible GM in our eyes. I know uh, you 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 aren't the biggest fan, but Chip and I like are real haters. Like we're real haters, and so because of this, I'm going to point out that David Griffin let Lonzo Ball walk and got Tomas Sadoransky, Garrett Temple, and a second yeah. round pick back just to draft Lonzo Ball at number eight overall in this year's draft. Uh, and you should. You should probably throw in the Devontae Graham contract, which they're now trying to unload because he didn't play, didn't play more minutes for them anymore because he's very small and not very good. John, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> what do you want to plug to the audience? What do you want to tell them to read, listen to, write to you, share with their local bodega cat? Subscribe to? Uh, let's see. Uh, Nick's Film School. Uh, oh, <laughs> bye! <laughs> subscribe to the Knicks Film School newsletter. Uh, shout out! I actually thank you to everybody who I saw. I got a bunch of uh, new subscribers over the last like day or so. Thanks to everybody who subscribed. Uh, I'm going to be pumping out lots of fun content um, throughout the summer, but it's really the next few weeks should be uh, fun. And then we'll, we'll keep, I'll keep churning out newsletters all the way through um, even during the slow season. So you at least have something to open and read, um, you know, almost every morning throughout the entire summer. And uh, yeah, you know, YouTube, uh, you're listening to this podcast. So I guess I don't need to plug that. And uh, again, yeah. Shout out class 2022 BHS uh, Borum Hill. You guys did it. Woo. Thanks John for coming on the show. You as well, Chris.